All right, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to KJV Bible Scope. I have uh, Brother Mike with me this evening, and we'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope Monday Night Bible Q&A. And uh, on the bottom of your screen, there is an email that says, Trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. That's trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. So uh, you would do well if you would like to ask a question to go ahead and write down that email, uh, put it in your phone, put it in your computer, write it down on a piece of paper, do it old school style. Uh, remember that email. And then if you email us your Bible question, we'll do our best or I'll do my best to kind of share it with brother Mike. And, and I'm not sure when brother Justin will be back, but, uh, they, they both have access to the information that I would send them concerning your question. So they would, we, we all would study out your question and then do our best to give you a Bible answer in one of the upcoming broadcasts. Remember, uh, we're doing this thing uh, first come, first serve basis. So I will put you in the list of all the other questions and we'll get to your question as soon as we are able to, as we answer these in chronological order. But before we get started tonight with our Q&A, we, we'd like to give you an opportunity to ask yourself the question as we help you with that question. If you die today, where would your soul spend eternity? And that is very important because Jesus Christ did not come to earth for nothing. He did not come and die for nothing. He did not resurrect on the third day for nothing. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you're not saved today, you are you are lost, just like me and Mike were at one time. And then we both heard the gospel of Jesus at different times and maybe in different ways. We heard the gospel. But nevertheless, we heard the gospel that Jesus died for our sins and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that truth was relayed to us and we responded to that truth and we believed what Christ did on the cross and his resurrection on the third day for the salvation of our souls. We did that. We put our faith in Jesus and you can do the same today. Uh, you don't need to be in a church. You don't need to, to be in front of an altar. You don't need to be in front of a pastor to get saved. All you need to do is hear the gospel according to the scriptures Believe on the gospel according to scriptures and put your faith and trust in Jesus and he'll save you from your sins. That's how faithful our God is. He's faithful. We have our time of being faithful in this life, whether it's to one another, to uh, our friends around us, to our job. I mean, we always have problems with faithfulness, but God doesn't never has a problem with faithfulness. If he said he would save you from your sins, if he would say he would give you eternal life, if he said that he would give you uh, reconciliation to himself, and he made that promise in the Bible, which he did, and you put your faith and trust in him, he will give you those things as a gift. What a great thing that our God does for us. So I'm going to go ahead and let Brother Mike open up. Go ahead, Brother. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Um, thanks for um, joining our broadcast. We do appreciate your faithfulness and coming back and having an interest in God's word. If it's your first time, thank you for joining us. Uh, we try to answer questions one, try, one a week normally. Um, they're submitted from you all about God's word. The answers we're going to give you are directly from God's word. We're not giving you our opinion. Because my opinion doesn't matter. God's opinion matters. So we want to make sure that you are getting God's opinion, God's word on all of this. The most important question, like Brother Ed said, is where you're going to spend eternity. Tonight's question, if, if you're going to be part of tonight's question, you're a saved person. If you're not saved, you need to consider your eternity. You have an eternal soul. Your eternal soul is going to dwell somewhere forever. And that's based on what you do with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And he is the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the way. There is no other way. He is the truth. Outside of Jesus Christ and his word, there is no truth. And without Amen. Jesus Christ, you don't have life. Of existence. We want to see you in heaven someday. It's great that we're answering all these questions. We can answer all your questions. You can die in your sins and go to hell without Jesus Christ. So you need to answer that most important question. 
where are you going to spend eternity? Hey Amen. Appreciate that, brother Mike. Uh, uh, just for those of you that, uh, you know, you've been on uh, the past few weeks. Uh, brother Justin has not been on, and uh, he has a lot of prior things going on right now. So just give him a little bit of grace. I'm not sure if he will be back. He may be back because he didn't say anything to me. Normally, if Justin doesn't plan on getting on anymore, he would let me know. So he may get on in future time, but just give him some grace right now. Me and brother Mike have been uh, doing our best to be faithful on here the much, as much as we can. And even brother Mike has a lot going on. So if he doesn't show up a few times on the broadcast, just have a little bit of grace. Um, Mike's got a whole lot going on right now, guys, too, as well. So uh, you guys just pray for us. Pray for this ministry. Pray for Brother Justin as well. Uh, pray we can keep this thing going. Uh, you know, none of us have a promise of tomorrow. Uh, we like to keep this thing going. But uh, under the grace and, and the mercy of God and and uh, according to, uh, you know, glory in Jesus Christ, we'd like to keep this thing going. So, um Without further ado, let's go ahead and get to these questions because a lot of times we end up going over and we need to get started here. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to throw this question on the screen and we've been answering one question at a time uh, per broadcast because we want to give you a good Bible answer, rightly divided. And sometimes we approach it in different angles just in case we didn't cover the angle you were coming from in the question. So we're going to do our best and uh, I'm going to throw it, uh, the question on the screen right now. And the question is, hi, Brother Ed. And uh, again, the whole question didn't fit on the screen. It was pretty long. So I put as much as it would allow me to on the screen. And the rest you're going to have to either read in the description or just listen in as I read it to you. OK. Hi, Brother Ed. Uh, a bride versus body. Uh, the word bride appears 14 times in the King James Version, five in the New Testament. However, nowhere is the phrase bride of Christ used. However, the phrase body of Christ is used on four separate occasions, all in the New Testament. That said, is the bride and body of Christ one and the same? I believe the Bible teaches they are different. What is your understanding from the word of God? Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, P.S. I do not espouse the Baptist Brider doctrine. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm not going to make any comments. I'll make my comments when it's my turn to go, but I'm going to pass it over to Brother Mike. He's going to go ahead and uh, he's going to have first dibs on this. Go ahead, brother. Hi, man. This is a pretty easy question. But it's also a very complicated question. It depends on how you approach it. If you are saved right now, you are part of the body of Christ. And what you have to look forward to in the future is becoming the bride of Christ. So being saved, there, there's a, there, the believer has two positions in Christ. The present position right here today on earth, if you're saved, you are part of the body of Christ. And it, regarding your future, you are eventually going to become the bride of Christ. Now, as to the union with Christ in the church, the church is his body. But the, the bride of the Christ, the bride of Christ is an intimate relationship with Christ and the church. The church is going to become his bride. And that's a, a future happening. Now, whenever God speaks of oneness between Christ and the church, we see Christ is ahead and the church is his body. Wherever the word shows distinction between Christ and the word, we see the, the church as the bride of Christ. So the, it is two separate things, but it's the same people in both parts. The bride of Christ and the body of Christ are the same group, just different aspects of time. Now, Adam and Eve were spoken of as becoming one flesh. They were two people. They became one flesh, but they were still two persons. God still counted them as two. Adam was Adam. Eve was Eve. They were united to be one. This is a relationship <laughs> between Christ and the church. The two become one. When God created man, he made a male. Amen female. Now, there are only two genders. There always has been. There always will be. We're going into that tonight. Eve came out of Adam. Thus, she and Adam were one. Eve was created with the rib of Adam. She actually came from Adam. They, they were one in flesh and one in marriage. However, since Adam and Eve both existed at the same time, there was no distinction between them. Even though the church and Christ exist together, there's also a distinction between them. Regarding oneness, they are one. But as to the matter of distinction, they differ, differ, sorry, differ from one from the other. These two positions have to do with present day 
and future. It's like when you're studying God's word, you need to find out who's talking to you. It's talking to the Jew, the Gentile, the Church of Christ. You have to get that straight. You have to know if it's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. You have to get that straight. Whenever you read a passage, you need to find out who it's talking to, what it's talking about. Today, the church is the body of Christ. Let me give you some scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. First Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, or bond or free, and all, all have been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, therefore is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the body were an eye, where are the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where are the smelling? What Jesus Christ is saying here is, we are all part of the same body. We all have different jobs. Some men can preach. Some men can teach. Some people can sing. Some people have, everybody has their own talent that God has given you that he wants you to use for Christ. Verse 18, but now God has set the members of everyone in one body and has pleased him. And, it, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now we are many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think less honorable, upon these we bestow, bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given them more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice in it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. That was a lot to read. And I think we needed to read all that to get to the, the, um, the, the context of it. Christ is about unity. Throughout the whole Bible, God's Christ, Christ is about unity. Never division. Satan divides. Christ wants unity. We are meant to be together as one. One in service, one in faith, one in fellowship. The problem today in a lot of churches is somebody will get mad at another member of the, Christ, of, of the body and then decide, I'm not going to church tomorrow. I'll just listen to it from home. They, they've separated themselves from the body. God says we need to stay together. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together, as a manner of such as some is, but exhorting one another. How can you exhort a brother in Christ if you're not there? As so the, the more, as you see the day approaching. God's word is clear that together we make up the body and he wants us to be together. That's important to understand. We need to make sure that we are in fellowship one with another. We, I get strength from Brother Ed. I get strength from other people in our church. I get strength from the fellowship that we have together. I need fellowship. I need to be iron sharpened with iron. I need to be together with other Christians. I need to hear from them how God's working in their life. I need to pray for you. I need to rejoice with you. We need to be together. Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Be clear, his body is the church. 2 Corinthians 11.2, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We as saved Christians are espoused to Jesus Christ. Just as Mary was a spouse to Joseph, and that before they came together, Mary was a child, he was called her husband. And she was his wife, even though they weren't married yet. Christ calls us his bride, even though the wedding hasn't happened yet. We are a spouse and not yet joined the Christ. We need to conduct ourselves as such. We need to act as if we are pure. We need to be pure. We need to be clean. We need to be faithful for Christ's sake, to Christ. The future, the church will be the bride of Christ. 
as, as a coming day. God gives us a picture of that and points our lives to that future. Ephesians 5.24, therefore, as a church is subject unto Christ, so let the wise be in their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy without blemish. God wants you to be clean. God wants you to be virtuous. The virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, that should be us. We need to be virtuous. We need to be clean. We need to we need, should need no spots, no wrinkles for Christ. Today, the body is a church. The church is the body of Christ for the purpose of service to Christ. Our job today is serving Christ. We need to witness. We need to preach. We need to help each other. We need to pray. One day, the church will be brought together with Christ. In that day, she will become the bride of Christ. Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Are you making yourself ready? Are you making yourself ready? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. There's going to be a grand wedding someday. Christ and the church are going to be united forever. God doesn't want us to be separated at any time. He said, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Right now, we're the church. Soon, we're going to be the body. The church is called the body of Christ because of several things. Um, the saved are the physical representation of Christ in this world. You need to be clean and separate so people know you belong to Christ. The church is where Christ is preached as one with a unit together. Those of the body of Christ are joined in Christ. Ephesians 4, 15 and 6, 16, but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joy supplieth, according to effectual working in every measure of every part, make it increase in the body and the edifying of itself in love. We are fit together. We Like a jigsaw puzzle, we perfectly fit together. Each piece is needed in the body the parts of the body are secure in place john 10 28 and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall they any man pluck them out of my hand my father which gave me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand we are fit together we are secure together and no man's going to pluck them out for christ to lose one part of the body we can't lose our salvation for us to lose our salvation, God would have to perform an amputation on the body of Christ. And God's not going to do that. God wants us to stay together. The members of the body of Christ follow Christ as their head, Ephesians 1.22, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The members of the body of Christ are the physical representation of Christ in this world. Christ is the organism which Christ... Uh, the church is the organism which Christ manifests his life in the world today. Parts of the body of Christ share a common bond with all Christians. It doesn't matter what race you are, what background you are, what skills you have, male, woman, Gentile, Jew, we all fit together. I, I read it before, 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. We should love each and every member of the body the same. I have friends I talk to at church. I talk to them more than other people. I don't love them more than the rest of the church. It's, we all have friends that we hang out with, but I love every single member of my church equally. I, I pray for them. I, I try to be there whenever they need me. It's something that God wants us to do. I fail, but I try my best to make sure that I am living the life Christ wants me to live. And that means having care, like the verse said, having the same care one for another. We are supposed to love each other. We're supposed to care for each other. And Christ wants us to do that equally. It's a hard thing to do, but Christ wants to do it. And if he says we should do it, we can do it. And that's something God has enabled us to do. The members of the body of Christ are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9, but you, have not, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So be that the spirit of God dwelt in you. 
Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Christ has put, gave us all the exact same Holy Spirit. God loves us equally. He puts us together. Again, we all have different gifts. My pastor is a great preacher. I can't preach like he can. He has, he's, he's enabled him in ways that, he, that I'm not enabled. But I'm enabled in places where Brother James is not enabled. We all work the gifts that we're given. Now, some people think the church of the church is the bride of Christ today. Now, there are churches out there that to teach that. I'm not going to go into that doctrine, Brother Ed probably will. This is wrong. There is no such thing. Since the Lord Jesus Christ is not yet the bridegroom, the Bible says it's a future thing. How could the church be already his bride? The church will not be brought to Christ until his bride, as his bride, until the work of the church as the body of Christ has been accomplished. In Genesis 2, we do see a picture there of the relationships. We do translate it, read Genesis 2. He was made from Adam, his rib. She was the body of Adam. And then she was brought to Adam. She became his bride, his help me. He was brought to Adam and she became his help me. She became Adam's bride. That which was out of Adam was the body of Adam, and that which was brought to Adam became his bride. Only that which came out of Adam came, came to him. The birds were brought to him. The animals were brought to him. All Adam did was name them. None of them were fit to be his helpmeet. None were intended to become his bride. We were all created to be in fellowship, one with another, and in relationship with our creator. God is a gentleman. God is not going to force himself upon you. If you're not saved right now, God's not going to force you to be saved. God loves you. God shed his blood on the cross for you. Jesus Christ died for you. He is going to send reminders your way. He's going to send gospel tracts, signs, preachers on the internet, preachers on the radio, preachers on TV to, to, to bring you into him. God's not going to force you to be saved. He loves you, but you need to choose to accept that love or to reject it. Like we started it out, you, salvation is the most important decision you're going to make. Today you can be saved, and you can become the part of the body of Christ, and look forward to being his bride. Or you can stay lost, and be separated from the body of Jesus Christ, and look forward to an eternity in hell. That's the only two choices you have. You, you have no other choices, and you know that in your heart. You know in your heart that you're a sinner, you know in your heart that Jesus Christ is God. You know in your heart that you need a Savior. The only thing stopping you from salvation is you. So the, the quick answer to the question is, the, the body of Christ is now. The bride of Christ is future. Something I'm looking forward to. Can't wait to be with Jesus Christ. Brother Ed? I mean, appreciate that, Brother Mike. Uh, I hope you guys have been taking notes on this. Uh, I need a... Uh, put this in fifth gear. I have a whole lot of notes on this. I'm going to try to cover as much as I can, but uh, it is uh, it is paramount to rightly divide the Bible. It is paramount to study to show yourself approved unto God. It is paramount that learning the Bible and understanding doctrine in the Bible involves an honest rendering of what you're reading in context. Uh, the problem is uh, there's all these agendas that people have that are outside of the Bible and they want to bring those agendas to the Bible. And a lot of that, a lot of those, these agendas are man-made doctrines that hold to uh, the teaching of somebody that somebody really respects or uh, a guy that's really well known in this circle. And what we need to do is not uplift a man. We need to uplift God. We need to uplift the word of God and trust what God said to us. Even if it goes against our favorite guy, that's a sinful man. You know, we need to trust in the sinless God. So a lot of times, uh, all of this doctrine is brought through uh, an agenda of people that want to hold to a man-made uh, idea outside of the Bible. So you just be really careful with that. Um, things that are different are not the same. I understand that we have a bride and we have body of Christ, but as Mike said earlier, um, the people are the same. We're just talking about the time and place when each happens. Um, I had to get saved before I became part of the church, but there was a time and a place when I did get saved. So at one time, mm -hmm. I was the church. I was not a member of the body of Christ. And then there was a time when a transaction was made when I believed on Jesus Christ. And when that transaction was made, I, I am now part of the church. And then 
I am not the bride yet, but it's coming. It's predestined. I'm I'm going to be there. Uh, it's in stone. I'm saved, and there's going to come a time when I'm going to be a partaker of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and as well as every other member of the body of Christ. So yes, the bride and the body are the same. The only thing we're we're, we're judging is when each thing happens. Right? You got to get saved to become part of the church, and then future time, you can partake of that marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, so that's kind of the idea in a nutshell, but we want to prove this scripturally, don't we? We just don't want Brother Ed or Brother Mike to just say, well, the bride is the church and the church is the bride. Well, show me some verses. Well, I, I remember that he mentioned, our guy right here mentioned that bride was mentioned five times in the New Testament. Let's have a look at some of these. We go to John 3.29. John chapter three, verse 29. We got to we got to put this in fifth gear here. He he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So the context, if you look very carefully at the context in John three twenty six, just go back a few verses there to verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. All right, listen. When John says, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, it was in reference when the people came to John and said, Jesus baptized, and all men come to him. Which means the bride would have to do with the people that are coming to Jesus. See how he did that? <laughs> not a city or inanimate object, not a certain group of people with an agenda, but all men that would come to Jesus, would, according to John the Baptist, would be the, be the bride of Christ. See that? He it declared in the Bible right there. Okay, so John 3, 29, now you know what it's dealing with concerning the bride right there. Go to Revelation 18, 23. We're going to look at the other, term, the, the other term bride right here, Revelation 18, 23. Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. Let's read it. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Hmm, interesting phrase there. For thy merchant were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. If you took that verse all by itself without the context, you could make that say anything you wanted it to say. Now, let, I'll show you my notes here. This is not in reference to Jesus being the bridegroom or the bride of Christ. This is in reference to, get ready, the judgments and punishments on Babylon and their way of life. This idea can be referenced throughout the book of Jeremiah. That terminology, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. There's nothing to do with the church. That's nothing to do with the bride of Christ. Go to Jeremiah 734. I'm going to show you this wording that's brought forth in the Old Testament. That's just saying, well, Think of a bride in general. Think think of the voice of the bride and the bridegroom in general. Talk about any bride and any bridegroom in general. Come on, people marry and are given in marriage. Even Gentiles do it, right? Because even though marriage, we'd say, is a biblical and godly institution, everybody does it, which is the light that God's given to all mankind. And every all mankind should say, hey, look at marriage. We all get married. That's pointing to a one true God, not any God, the Christian God. But we're not covering that right now. We're just covering the terminology here, bride and bridegroom, and this voice that will not be heard anymore. So it has nothing to do with the church and Jesus's voice not being heard anymore. But look at Jeremiah 734, where I told you to go to. Then will I call to see. So the, the Lord God is speaking through Jeremiah the prophet here. When Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride for the land shall be desolate. You see the judgment God is placing there? Come on. He's placing that judgment upon Jerusalem. And yes, uh, Jews get married, right? There's bridegrooms and there's brides. But God is saying this is a general punishment for everybody. People are going to be 
they're going to be, it's going to be a desolation. There's, there's going to be a ceasing of all this. There's not going to be a gladness. There's not going to be a joy anymore. You see that? Now this concept, I don't have time to read all of these, okay? But write these verses down. This concept is all throughout Jeremiah. You can go to Jeremiah 16, 9, there's a judgment on Israel, and he causes their voices to cease, the bride and the bridegroom. God sends the king of Babylon against Israel to punish them, and that's also in reference to Revelation 18, 23 of that reference of bride right there. It's dealing with Babylon. So he causes the voice of the bridegroom and the bride to cease in Babylon. Why? Because he's punishing them. That's, uh, so that's Jeremiah 16, 9 and uh, Jeremiah 25, 10. And those are other references to the voice of the bride and bridegroom shall be heard no more. God punishes the nations that come up against Israel. But when they are free from captivity, there is praise from the bride and the bridegroom and joy in the land. That has nothing to do with the bride of Christ and Jesus. Now we can rejoice now in our way of life. Now there can be marriage. And when the bridegroom can uh, the bridegroom can speak his voice now and have joy in his voice, the, the bride can now have joy in her voice. Because look, there is now God freeing them from captivity and there's reason to rejoice. See that? See, see where we're going? And that's the same exact concept of Revelation 18.23. So what did we just do? We're covering in context all those mentionings of bride, right, in the New Testament. And we are not to be confused. Why? Because we have a context. And we can get precept upon precept and, and expound on these ideas so we don't get sidetracked or wrongly divide the Bible, okay? So very important. Next one, next one. We got to, we got to, we got to fly through these. Revelation 21, 2. Revelation 21, 2. Go there. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Pay attention to that. Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a what? Prepared as a bride. Now, I want you to key in on the wording here. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared because it is a bride adorned for her husband. It doesn't say that, does it? Because a city by itself, buildings, gate, golden gates, golden streets, are don't have living souls. They don't have fellowship with God. Do you understand that? What is important about New Jerusalem? Is it, it isn't the fact that people are trying to make some inanimate object, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. It's the believers. So these believers one day will be in that city. And when we talk about uh, people in the city and they're being adorned. Now, I want you to pay attention to that adorning there because adorning is putting on something, right? It's they're putting on the gold, the jewels of that city. And they're prepared for Jesus Christ for that marriage supper of the Lamb. You see that? It's not some inanimate objects that God wants a relationship with. It's people. So you said, why is that so important that you say all this, right? Because there are people that will wrongly divide just Revelation 21, and they will say that the city, New Jerusalem, without the people in it, is the bride. <laughs> I've had there, there are people that I know that say that. OK, so you got to watch out there. And I don't know the direction our brother is coming from in, in the question. I mean, maybe he's coming. I don't know. Maybe because he didn't clarify anything. Maybe he's coming from that direction that Revelation 21 is the bride. And, the, and then the church will be living in the bride. That's kind of a weird concept. But again, people believe some strange things. OK, so look at our next point. Now, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to expound on Revelation 21, too. Because with Revelation 21, 9, because we're going to still be in the same context. But that is our next mentioning a bride right there. So go down to verse 9 and let's read this one. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will shew thee the bride. Now, who's the bride? It couldn't be the lamb's wife, because... A bride couldn't be a wife yet till after the marriage supper of the lamb. Or, or if that commitment is there, is the lamb, is, is, is the church already the wife? You see, see what I'm saying? So it's almost the bride is the wife. We're just talking about time period, right? <laughs> okay, so so watch this. 
we're dealing with context, right? Revelation 21, 2. And I saw John, I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And you highlight this prepared as, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now look at verse three. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the what? The tabernacle of God is with men. What's the tabernacle of God? What's the tabernacle of God, guys? Tabernacle of God is the body of Christ. Okay. The church. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his what? His inanimate objects, the, these gates, pearly gates, these cities of, of gold or streets of gold. No, it says his people right there. Come on, look at verse three very carefully. The tabernacle of God was what? The people, right? The church. We're, come on, context is everything, right? He will dwell with them and they shall be his what? His people. We're not talking about cities that don't have life. We're talking about people in the city. And God himself shall be with what? The city or with them? See the context? With them. And be their what? Their God. Now look at verse four. And God shall wipe away all the tears coming down from the sides of the buildings. Nope. Nope. People. People have tears. The church has tears. And he's going to wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Why? Why? Because buildings don't die. Human beings die. Right? Mm -hmm. But we're glorified human beings now. We're in the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Because and all it does is it's a matter of time when we're not. We're not. We're still going to be the church, obviously, because of Hebrews, the church of the firstborn. But we will be the bride of Christ after that marriage supper of the mm -hmm. Lamb. So all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain because uh, human beings have pain. Right. For the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 27. Next verse or or fast forward a little bit because this is part of the context here. I want you to see because we're focusing on people here. That's why we're going to verse 27. Now watch this. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Now we're talking about, if you're talking about the New Jerusalem, the city itself, without any people in it, being the bride, then it says no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Does do other can other buildings defile the buildings in New Jerusalem? Because if all we're talking about is buildings, then certainly we must continue with that context of of just the bride being building and more buildings coming in to join the bride right no that's ridiculous nobody would render it that way and we're not rendering it that way look what it says neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh the like because that's what people do right people human beings people that have living souls can do that right but they which are written which means these people are already in the city they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we're talking about they. They are the people that we talked about earlier in the context, starting in verse 2, right? The people, verse 3, the tabernacle of God, the people, verse 3, his people, the, the, the people again, uh, wiping all tears from their eyes, verse 4. It's the people. God wants fellowship with people. His bride deals with the church, which are people. He doesn't have an atom and objects. Now, the, the next problem with the rendering of this, because our, our person wasn't specific as to what he means by the difference between the church and the bride of Christ. Our guy never gave the difference there, what he thought the difference was, which leaves us to go to about a billion different angles, right? So that's what I did. I'm covering a bunch of different angles of what I've heard over the years of what, where people go and we're refuting those angles, right? We're trying to tell you that the church and the, 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 the church, the body of Christ are the same. And it's what my uh, brother Mike said earlier. It's just a matter of time period. Okay. Now look at revelation 22, 17. We got to get a move on. I still have a lot here. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hear it say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Context. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to what? To testify unto you these things in the what? In the churches. 
Do you see the context? We're still in the context of the bride. So we're dealing with the churches. We're dealing with the spirit and the bride, right? Verse 16 and 17. Now, watch this. The Holy Spirit and the church. Come on, we're talking about church age dispensation. The Holy Spirit and the church has always been unified in winning the lost. Correct? Look at John 16, 8, if you don't believe me. And we and when he has come, that's the comforter, right? When he has come, Jesus Christ talking right there in John 16. And when he has come, the comforter, right? He will reprove the world of what? Of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, I shouldn't have to go through all that if you know the Bible fairly well. But there's probably people on here that don't know the Bible fairly well. Why of sin? Why is the comforter? Why is the Holy Ghost? Who is the comforter? Why is he reproving the world of sin? Because they don't believe on Jesus. Verse 9. Right? Question. I mean, come on. Righteousness, because I go to my father, you see me no more. Because only the righteous can inherit the kingdom of God, right? Only the righteous can inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is the only one that was ever righteous. Okay? Now, yeah, you can say I'm righteous too. No, no you were made righteous. According to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, by the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. And he gave you that righteousness so you could be reckoned righteous in the eyes of God. No, you're not righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. And that includes church people. Nobody's righteous by their own merits. You, you, you are made righteous in the reckoning of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. So make, make sure you get that thing right. Okay. No, nobody's righteous like Jesus. That's why you can't inherit the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So, so look, look, look what he says right there in John 16, 10 of righteous because I go to my father and you see me no more. Nobody can just get, get born one day and just say, I'm going to go to my father and you'll see me no more. You're, you're a sinner just like I am. You're, you're there's no way you're going to get there without Jesus. Look at verse 11 of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You know what? We are all under the prince of this world before we're saved. Satan is our father, John 8, 44, right? He's our father. And and and, and we're going to do the lust of our father, uh, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, right? Come on. We're, we're of the world, all of us. So what's what, what am I getting at? What's the, what's the whole point of all this? Jesus is going to send this comforter, right? Jesus is going to send this Holy Ghost down. It's a promise. And that promise, the full revelation of that promise was given at Pentecost. You guys remember that in Acts chapter 2? Remember that? Now, did, did the Holy Spirit come down in Acts 2 and not dwell within the believers? So he would be able to accomplish John 16, 8, 9, and 10, and 11? Are you guys get where I'm going? The spirit and the bride say, come, where am I going with all of this? Ever look, ever since Jesus promised the coming of the spirit, the spirit and the bride were always trying to convince the world to come to Jesus through the gospel. Come on, guys. You got to stay with me on this. But that's what we're talking about right there. How do I line up the bride right there with the church? Because of what we just said. Say, we'll prove the, prove the bride is the church. We'll prove the church is the bride. We're doing it right now. Mm. Okay. So let's keep moving here. Did a little bit of that. So we, cover, we, we covered some of that. Now, um, hyper dispensation and Baptist brider, uh, two problem doctrines um, in the Bible believing realm. OK, uh, false doctrine. People end up clinging to those things and making divisions within the church. And that's why you have all these breakoffs of Baptist churches and all kinds of churches around because people want to cling to a doctrine uh, that's not even in the Bible or doesn't, it's not even taught in the Bible, just cherry pick uh, or rendering some shady passages of scripture in the Bible that are not clear. And then they make doctrine out of it. So be careful. I'm going to really quickly try to cover this little flock, false doctrine. I got, I got to go there guys. I've been hammered with this over the past, I don't know, past two or three years. I have these hyper dispensationalists emailing me and they're trying to give me this thing. And and I can see how somebody can take this false doctrine and make a distinction between the church, the church and 
the body of Christ, the church versus the bride of Christ and making two separate things there. And I don't know if our guy may be coming from this angle. Could he be saying that the little flock of Luke 12, 32, which states, fear not little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Talking to a group of Jews or what these people consider, which it was at the time, uh, some disciples and some, some, some apostles that were there. And considering these first apostles or these first disciples as a category of little flock, and then this carries over to the New Testament, which they wrongly divide Acts chapter two and say Peter was preaching a little flock gospel that was only for the Jews. Right. Hyper dispensation saying there's two gospels, one of the circumcision and one of the uncircumcision. So you so they they carry this little flock doctrine to its destruction, because when you follow that logic to the end, it everything contradicts in the Bible, okay? Because when you get to the council of Acts 15, what do you do with that? When he says, well, the Gentiles were saved even as we were saved by the same gospel. Both Jews and Gentiles have the same gospel, and that was taken care of in the council of Acts 15, okay? So there should be no doubt in our minds about that, but, you know, people still uh, try to ride this false doctrine to its destructive conclusion, and they don't care if it has a destructive conclusion because they're so set in their ways. So let's look at let's look at a little bit of this, and then we're going to move on. Uh, I've heard the preaching of First Corinthians one ten. There was nothing wrong with the messengers. They say that well, the messengers were basically preaching different aspects of the gospel. That's why there were divisions in the church, and they weren't of the same mind because. The messengers were preaching different gospels or different sides of two different gospels. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so they use 1 Corinthians 1 10 as the proof text, which it doesn't teach that because if you get the context of 1 Corinthians 1 and you go to 1 Corinthians 3 as well, you can see that it was the Corinthian understanding of making one person that delivered the gospel to them of more importance than others that were delivering the gospel, including Jesus Christ. Some would say, well, I'm of Christ. That means I'm better than you. Jesus delivered the gospel to me. I'm better than all of you. And then one would say, no, I'm better than Paul because I was, I got my gospel from Apollos. And see, that's what they were doing. It wasn't different gospels. It was people elevating the men that delivered the gospel to them and trying to make that of, of, of very you know high importance. Okay, so there was a warning about doing that in there. Who cares who you were baptized by? Do you have the gospel? If you have the gospel, why are you acting this way? We should all be like-minded, one-minded in the unity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was a constant rebuke over and over again in 1 Corinthians, okay, and 2 Corinthians. So... There was no different gospels being preached there. So don't let anybody fool you because that preaching is going on right now on YouTube. They have a lot of that kind of preaching going on. Yeah. Just read the context of First Corinthians and you shouldn't have any problems with that. OK, so the church and the body of Christ, one in the same. The church just got to they just have to wait for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's we just said that over and over again. But you got to come on. Re repetition's the key, guys. Get it in your mind. Let it be a habit. OK, well, if I say it over and over again, you're not going to be defaulting back to, you know, some ha habitual belief system you had before. That's why we got to continuously say it over and over again and bring it to your remembrance. OK. So another thing, another thing of importance of the separation or trying to uh, hyper divide the Bible um, people want to say, well, again, this whole Jewish thing about the Jews are the sheep and the church is not the sheep. The church is something else. So, so the Jews are literally the bride of Christ and the church is just the body of Christ. So you have that kind of, so you got that kind of false teaching there. So go to John 10, 24. I want to show you this. You can't make all of Israel's Israel Christ sheep. You can't. But that's what people do. They make all of Israel Christ sheep. Jesus actually speaks to the Jews and tells them this. Look at John 10, 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long does thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you 
and ye believe not. He, he said, I told you Jews. Jews that people are making, these are all God's sheep. These are all Jesus' sheep. Watch this. Jesus answered, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Now look at verse 26 carefully. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Are all of Israel Christ's sheep? No. <laughs> See how he did that? Real, real easy. We're already going on to our next section here. Now, look at, um, look, I, I don't even look at this. Just write it in your notes because we don't have time. Uh, write this in your notes, Acts 15, 11, And that is dealing with the Jews talking about the gospel goes to the Gentiles and the Jews. And it's the same gospel. And both Jews and Gentiles are saved by the same gospel. There, there should be no doubt in your mind that there's, that there's only one gospel when I say gospel, let's get specific. There's only one gospel of Christ. I have to say it that way, okay? Now, so we have this one. Go to Hebrews 12, 23. I want you to see this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to what? To what? The spirits of just men made perfect. Do you see that? What is the church of the firstborn dealing with? The spirits of just buildings made perfect. Nope. The spirits of just men. Come on, guys. We're those people. <laughs> We're those spirits of just men made perfect. Why would does anybody have any doubt that the church is the bride and the bride is the church? God cares about the church. Jesus cares about the church. But I got to go a step further. You want more proof that the church is the bride and I want it in scripture. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm, I'm, I'm moving down in my notes here. I want you to see this very carefully. Look at this carefully. Go to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. While you're turning to Ephesians, just, just hold on for a split second here. I'm going to give you the exact verse to go to. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Now, context is everything. Don't, we're not just going to read one verse because I still have time to read the whole thing here. Now, watch this. This is so important to the, to, to the answering of this question scripturally. Watch this. Ephesians 5.22. It's going to sound like I'm not covering the answer. But if you just stay with me and just focus and tune in and just hang on every word that I'm saying in the Bible, you will see that the church and the bride are synonymous. And the only difference is, is that there has to come a time when we become the bride, right? At the marriage supper. Watch this, Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So there's, there's a principle there. We got some practical truth here for marriage, right? Now watch, but we're not focusing on that right now. Just look at what we're talking about. Relationship, right? Relationship between wives and husbands. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now what? What? Why would why would the verse say this right here? Why? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Well, brother Ed, see, well, you just proved that, you know, the church is there. You mean the, the all the believers are part of the church. You proved that, but you didn't prove anything else. But that's why I told you to keep listening. Look at verse 24. Therefore, as the church subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Why are we comparing the church to the wives? If, if the church isn't the bride of Christ, what need of a comparison of the church with a wife? Anybody that doesn't believe the church is the bride can answer that? <laughs> no, 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 we're not done yet. Let's just keep going. It's, it's, it's an overkill right here. Look at this. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Wait a minute. He gave Christ gave his life for the body of Christ, but he would never give his his life for a wife or a bride, would he? But that's the comparison. The husband should give his life for his wife, his bride. Wow. Oh, brother, I never saw that before. Well, you need to look at this thing. You need to look at all scripture, not just your cherry-picked scriptures. You need to look at it all. 
Look at verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Why would he need to do that? Look at, look at verse 27, gives you the answer. That he might present it to himself. He's presenting himself, the church. Amen. In the context of what? A wife, a bride to a husband. That's the context. He might present it to himself. What do you need? Why would he need to present it to himself? A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That it should be holy and without blemish. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's his bride. It's his bride. Ephesians 5.29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord, the church. Does the Lord cherish the church? That sounds like a relationship a husband and a wife would have. Come on. That's the context. Uh, Ephesians 5.30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and look, and of his bones. Now watch this. Verse 31, for this cause of what we just read about Christ and the church not having spot or wrinkle, all that stuff we just read. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and should be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh in the context of what? Christ in the church. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Where is that from? When Adam and his wife were married. Bam, bam. I mean, that's overkill, guys. This is overkill. Look, now watch this. We just talked about this. And yeah, if somebody's really looking for something to hang themselves with, they could say, but it didn't say bride of Christ. Right? Right? It, common sense of what we just read will bring you to the conclusion that the church is the bride. Okay? But look at this. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery. Ooh. But I speak, what? Concerning Christ and the church. And Brother Ed's footnote, a.k.a. Bride of Christ. <laughs> Do you see how he did that? No, there should be no doubt in your mind that the church is the bride of Christ and the bride of Christ is the church. There is no element of the bride of Christ being something different than the church. There's only time period. Future time, the church will become the bride of Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's all you need to know as far as distinctions. So, did, did we understand that? Was that, I don't know I'm bad sometimes at explaining things, but it was pretty crystal clear to me. And if you still don't believe that, email me. Please email, email me. I'll send you my notes. Maybe me explaining it isn't doing the truth justice. But look at... um. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 1. A few more minutes of time here. Without a shadow of a doubt, this verse is teaching the mystery of the bride of Christ. We mentioned Ephesians 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Look at this one. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. The church. The context is the church that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He didn't say specific individuals. He didn't say, well, you elite faith people right here in this little section of the church. No, there is no special elect people that become the bride of Christ. He says, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear at least by any means. As a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And I think there's a lot of people that would like to beguile you and to make you think that the bride is something separate from the church. Maybe through good works, good deeds. Maybe through certain code of conduct. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For me to understand God presenting me, the church, or everybody else as part of the church, to Christ would make that complicated, would make that hard for me to understand. The Bible says it's the simplicity that is in Christ in the same context of verse 1 and 2. Anybody confused on that? If you're confused on that, please email me. I'll try to unconfuse you, but I only can do so much. Now, the final, the final one that I wanted to do because I didn't have time. I didn't, I didn't have time to cover a quarter of my notes here. 
Body of Christ, adopt a uh, body of Christ, Colossians 124, adopted children, Ephesians 1 5. We are part of the whole family in heaven, Ephesians 3 15, accepted in the beloved, all of us are. Ephesians 1 6, fellow citizens with the saints, Ephesians 2 19, believing Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of the same body, Ephesians 3 6, believing Gentiles are partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, Ephesians 3 6, we are the spirits of just men who perfect. I mentioned that earlier, Hebrews 12 22. We are chosen generation, 1 Peter 2 9. We are royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2 9. But you know what some people would do? They would say, all of those, that list of things that I made, those are all different things. And you have to qualify for those different things. When I would just simply tell you those are all synonymous with the church. Holy nation, 1 Peter 2, 9. The people of God, 1 Peter 2, 10. Members in one body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. We're a new man, Ephesians 4, 24. We're spiritual men, 1 Corinthians 1. Followers of God, Ephesians 5, 1. Followers of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Followers of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. Some people would try to say those are all separate things. And they would take shady passages of scriptures to try to prove that. And I would say all of those are synonymous. Children of light, Ephesians 5, 8. Being saved, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Quickened, Ephesians 2, 1. Heirs of God, uh, Romans 8, 17. Joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. That's all synonymous with the church. People would like to, to take those things and make those things different as to confuse you and take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Amen. You see that? See all those synonymous terms? There should be no doubt in your mind that the bride of Christ is the church and the church is the bride of Christ. We only talked about aspect of time when those things will happen. So two more things, two more things. We're already at 901. Two more things, and I think they're really important because I just bumped into them concerning our topic here. Do you guys remember... Okay, hold on. Uh, uh, Mike, are you still on? I'm still here. Hey. Okay, they were saying the connection was lost on the internet, but no, we're still good now. It, it just reconnected. Okay, so we have in the Bible, and I'm not conclusive with this, okay? So don't, don't say, Brother Ed, you know, you were conclusive about this. Uh, I'm giving you some examples here, okay? There are at least, at least, mind you, at least, that's what I'm saying, at least, I didn't say conclusively. There are at least 16 types and pictures of the rapture of the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm not going to give you all of them. I'm only going to give you the ones that are dealing with a picture and type of the bride of Christ. Ruth. And you can find that in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. After she becomes bride of the kinsman redeemer, she disappears. You don't read about her again. That is a type of the rapture of the church. Look that up. Do that study. Okay? I don't have time. We're, we're, we're already on, uh, short on time. We're already, I think we're already time now. Isaac, Isaac, look at Isaac. Meeting Rebecca, Genesis 24, 65. The man that walketh in the field to meet us. The type of the rapture of the church. Asenath, the Gentile bride of Joseph. She was kept from seven years of tribulation of famine. Genesis 41, 50, type of rapture of the church. And our fourth one, Song of Solomon. You can find that in Song of Solomon, chapter two, verses eight to 13. It says, rise up, come away. That's all, that's all we have to say about that. The type of Christ tells the bride, which is a type of rapture of the church. Amen. A bride, it's a bride. Who's the bride? The church. See that? See, see how we did it? Come on. You, you, you mess up typologies and foreshadows. You mess up these things if you want to say that the church is not the bride of Christ. Because then the church doesn't go up in the rapture. You're telling me that God's only going to get a select few to go up in the rapture and the rest of the church stays behind? Watch out. Watch out. Now, final thought. I thought this was really good to close out. I had so much here. But I only can cover this. It is the, 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 the type of bride of Christ concerning Genesis. Watch this. You ready for this? I'm going to go through this, try to do this really quickly here. 
In Genesis 3.22, that's my reference. So if you want the reference, Genesis 3.22. Adam has a perfect relationship with God. Okay. Now we're talking about this bride of Christ. Okay. Now watch this. Watch this great typology here. Adam has a perfect relationship with God. He is living in harmony with God, but God says this man would be better off with a helpmeet fitted just for him. God made that woman not to plow, not to cook and sew, not to sit on the sofa and look pretty. God made that woman so the man would not be alone as he enjoyed God. Man has a relationship with God, but God wants him to have a relationship with someone who is like him, who can love him and give to him and be a blessing to him. She got her life from God, but not without the man. God put the man to sleep and her life came from him. The man Christ Jesus. Now watch this comparison. The man Christ Jesus has a perfect relationship to God, but he takes on a body of human flesh. He comes down to earth and he sleeps the sleep of death. And then God the Father brings out of God the Son, the very life of God, the Son. And from the life of God the Son, God the Father makes him a bride, a helpmeet for him. Not to plow, not to cook and sow, not to sit in our congregations and look pretty for him, but to walk with him and talk with him and fellowship with him and to praise him. Eve was blemished when she ate the piece of fruit. Did Adam put her away? No. Did Eve cease to be his wife? No. Did they live many years together? Yes. But a lot of heartache came from dabbling in that world. It didn't end the relationship, but it wasn't what it could have been. It didn't end their union, but it certainly hindered a great many things. I'm saved forever. I'm bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And he sealed me with the Holy Spirit. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. He'll never put me away. Did you guys get it? Did you guys get it? See the typology there? The bride of Christ. God the Father took out of God the Son. He put him to sleep and he gave him a bride. The church is the bride of Christ. And anybody can be partake of that. Anybody can become part of the church to eventually become part of the bride of Christ. The moment we're after the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's set in stone. Did you see that? I want you to be saved. But what I want, what you want may be two totally different things if you're lost and undone today. But I'm telling you right now, as a human being, you need Jesus. You got an empty void inside of your life today. You have, you have, you have a, a eternal void that you will never find peace unless you find Jesus Christ. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. We want you to have that peace. God wants you to have that peace. He said, Jesus, he, he did all the work for you. All you've got to do is simply humble yourself and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Respond to what Jesus did. Love your creator because he loves you and he wants you to be his bride. How about that for a closing right there? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'm going to go ahead and let Brother Mike close out. Go ahead, brother. Hey Amen. I've enjoyed this study. I learned a lot. I mean, I... I even though I studied it out, I always learn something from Brother Ed. What a blessing. The most important thing, again, we keep going back to it over and over again, because it is important. If you are not saved, you need to get saved. Jesus Christ died for you. He rose from the dead. He wants you to go to heaven. He's not willing that any should perish. Uh, I don't know what it is. You, you know what it is that's keeping you from being saved. You need to get beyond that and just take your sin to Jesus Christ. Uh, I've heard all the time, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, Jesus knows what you've done. There's, not, there's no sin beyond Jesus Christ's reach. I want you to get saved. I want to see you in heaven someday. I know Brother Ed does. It's our prayer that you get saved and then know the Lord. We hope these Bible studies, we don't really scratch the surface tonight. We hope these Bible studies will prompt you to further study because God's word is endless. We only, again, we only scratch Amen. the surface. We only started this study tonight. We want you to get into the word. We want you to dig for yourself. It's it's a blessing to dig in God's word and find something. It's a joy. It's exciting when I find something. I want to tell somebody. Amen. So our prayer to you is that you get saved and that you grow. We do thank you, everybody, for coming here. Thanks for everybody who made a comment tonight. We sure do love you guys. Pray in Jesus' Amen. name. We'll see you again. Good night.